There's no better way of starting a best of something less than a bunch of caveats, if anything, to manage the expectations and cop out of the excessively loud title. So, what am I gonna cover my glucial region with while scurrying for safety? For one, there's far more classes in the game than nine, but we'll talk about those which you can buy for a core force during campaigns and rank them according to how useful they are the many successive battles and environments. And it's not just about the stats of particular units. There's managing your procedure reserves and not listening class get too expensive, there's adapting to guns of enemies you encounter, and there's building a versatile army that doesn't leave you frantically shopping for new units when things go slightly mad. I should also warn you that this list revolves around Baraboos, I mean Germans, but in a game called Panzerko, it's something to be expected. Although the overall approach stays the same for the other playable nations and campaigns, there are certain deviations, certain unit types you can and can't buy, and I will mention a couple here, though anything more thorough will have to wait for another video. Anyway, enough of this old nonsense, and let's get straight to... Do you want to know which is the bestest class of them all? Then look at the name of the game again and see Panthers, Tigers, Leopards, and other bzz, bzz of the feline family. Panthers, tanks, get more of them, now. They absolutely must be the most represented unit class in your core. In all fairness, early war German tanks leave a lot to imagining how great it'd be to have an all Silver Force in 1939 and slowly but steadily flatten everyone in Europe by 2012. They're quite vulnerable, can't attack well anywhere unless the terrain's ID and there's plenty of support, but they do go fast and they do place those punches where you need them, all while your infantry trudges behind three hexes at a time. It gets better as the war progresses, and as soon as the tiger rolls off the factory floor, you know you won't be threatened by drunken partisans swinging bastards around. The tanks will become synonymous with your force, and every other class will only be making sure that your panzers can stay alive and do their job. There are also a couple of choices you'll have to take when buying German tanks. Early Panzer 3s may seem like a good bet compared to 4s, but they're quickly outmatched and outgunned. Plus, I think early Panzer 4s good soft attack easily compensates for any weaknesses of the tank, so go for. You should convert your entire force to the tigers and king tigers as soon as they're available though, they'll become the workhorse to pull you through the last years of the war. I've never understood the panthers in this game. While interesting as an idea, they end up too vulnerable and not powerful enough, taking up slots that should be left to the tigers. Mouse? Fun. But don't buy it with your own money. Your second most worthwhile class in the game, and my absolute personal favourite. Artillery. I must have been stealing notes from Zhukov, because squeezing in human amounts of guns into battles and blasting everything into nearly radioactive dust to let the front unit saunter in and finish off whatever is still moving is pretty much always the battle plan, and never gets old. Artillery is your master key to any fortress and your ultimate fixer. The more that you have, the more suppression it delivers, the less damage your units take, the less you have to spend on reinforcements, the more you get to spend on having more artillery. It's a vicious circle, but beautiful. A delicious circle. I think it goes beyond saying that self-propel beats Toad all the time, while Toad artillery tends to be more powerful, being able to move and shoot on the same turn is far more valuable. You rarely have the luxury of waiting for suppression to come. Beside Hummels, your premier core for self-propelled gun, it's worth having some rocket artillery to smack enemy infantry around a little bit harder, and as soon as they appear, get some 280mm railway guns with their high range and humongous damage stats that'll help you crack entire battles. The only real weakness of artillery becomes evident immediately if the unit is attacked by pretty much much anything. They're extremely poor on the defense, and keeping your flanks tight is a must. So is a sizable air defense force, which is actually the third element on the main force trad in Panzer Cool. Fighters. This is the only one of the top classes that you use because you have to, not because you really want to. You need them no matter what. They excel at achieving their superiority both of their stats and outstanding experience bonuses. And that's fine. What isn't fine though is when there are no enemy planes left in the sky, you really wish you had something better, as fighters have the worst ground attack stats in the game. But you don't get to be picky when it's 1943 and you have to fight a third and a fourth and a fifth wave of Yaknais of a curse can still win. Like it or not, your fighter fleet will swell over time you'll have to find ways to cope with their terrible performance against ground units and carve out whatever advantage it might provide you with. They're certainly more useful against anything that has low air defense like artillery and tanks, but even with infantry, their attacks reduce entrenchment and they contribute that little bit to a major objective that makes a difference between a marginal and a decisive victory. And they do make excellent scouts. You might ask, why infantry isn't included in the top three? Why infantry isn't included in the top three? And the answer is that while useful, it isn't good enough to be a major class. Early in the war, the tanks are kinda crappy, there's less prestige handed out, so if you squint really hard, you might squeeze infantry into the main frontline role. A few dozen nearly killed core units later, you'll see that it doesn't work, and your infantry feels much more at home as a specialist and utility force. Cracking a fortress, removing a minefield, bridging a river, defending a village, power dropping it 
distraction. It's perfect for these crucial tasks, and the low cost of these units plays into this. Repurposing them for a specific battle isn't much of an investment. However, the only reason you might want to have more than three or four with some experience are large city scenarios. Infantry is too easy to kill to form the backbone of your force, and tanks become increasingly versatile as the war progresses. You know how I love artillery so very, very much? Now what if we had a couple of wings and a propeller to it? We get artillery in lower atmosphere! Yep, strategic bombers are phenomenal. Imagine an artillery gun that has a range of 12 and doesn't care about terrain. They also kill ships like no one else and destroys enemy ammunition supplies and neutralizes tanks if you really don't want the baddies reinforcing them. They are a blast that gets you victory, so why the measly fifth place in the rating you ask? What's the dirty catch? The catch is that the enemy eventually learned to push back. Around 1943, the Mount of Allied anti-air defenses skyrockets, and even if you achieve air superiority, your strap bombers will end up beat up pretty badly after each battle. And being kinda pricey, they'll drain your wallet with admirable efficiency, so yes, use their head out of them while you can, then relegate them to naval battles and missions where the enemy clearly don't have too much to defend their air space with. Buy more Hummels instead. Recon units are a bit like strat bombers in how their usefulness diminishes as your campaigns in the war progress. It's 1939 and they're about as effective as your tanks, but much faster, has superior spotting range and segmented movement. They're perfect for raking in prestige from all the secondary flags, feeling up enemy defenses, spotting traps and getting in quickly to contribute that last slap before the enemy unit reinforces. They are quite wonderful, and it would be naughty of me to say I didn't like them and wouldn't stick one or two in my core force any day of the week. But it's 1942 now, and their statistics haven't advanced much. Lagging far behind your frontline troops, especially in defense, they get too vulnerable. I think most of the times I had to say scum in a scenario lost a core unit was because I made a mistake and strayed a little too far with the recon guy. The fact that the AI prioritizes recon units as targets doesn't help either. At the same time, with a large number of fighters and heroes, the spotting radius bonus becomes less impressive, having high speed is less important than not letting your artillery fall behind, and the advantages of segmented movement can be compensated through better planning. In other words, enjoy your recon units for what they're worth, and gently phase them out. Okay, we're down to the bottom three, and it's time to see who's the best of the worst for me. Tactical bombers, especially German ones, are some of the iconic weapons of the war, but leave a lot to be desired in the game. It's worth noting that there are two classes conflated into one here. First, there are the dedicated light bombers, like the Stuka or Henschel 129, which I believe deserve very little attention or respect, and second, we have the fighter bombers, like BF 110s and late war Focke Wars 190s, which are still very iffy, but my potentially find a place in your core force. Your alternative to light bombers is obviously strategic bombers, and it's no comparison at all. Strap bombers always win. Early in the war, Stukas do pack more of a punch and might be quite enticing, but they don't inflict lasting suppression, they don't destroy enemy ammo supplies, they don't have a decent naval attack, and they do get damaged whenever they bomb ground units that can shoot back. Worse, in 1941 and 42, you get strap bombers that are at least as good as, but usually better than light bombers in ground attack. In addition to delivering all their class-related goodies, the only significant mid and late war advantage of light bombers is that they are much cheaper. But this is where your skill and ability to manage prestige comes into play, and so does the usually restrictive force limit, which encourages you to have fewer, but better and probably more expensive units. Fighter bombers aren't as clear cut terrible, and given that you have to keep a large fleet of fighters anyway, you might get a few crossover units to be more useful when you achieve their superiority. But while some fighter bombers have really nice tasks compared to their contemporary fighters, they are universally weaker and make for attractive targets targets if the enemy haven't advanced enough air force. This is compounded by the fact that being tactical bombers, they don't get their attack and initiative bonus from experience, which can make a world of difference later in the war when both friendly enemy fighters tend to be quite battle-hardened. <sighs> this is slightly embarrassing, but I have to admit, I have a growing dislike for German anti-tank weaponry in this game. It's got more chances of redeeming itself than I can count, and the verdict has always been the same. Just get a tank instead. The strength of tank destroyers is their weakness, they trade everything off for that bonus heart attack, which isn't all that impressive considering that tanks are quite competent at it anyway, and most of the challenging bits in the game are strong points defended by elite infantry and artillery anti-air support. You need good soft attack, better close defense, more initiative, and tank destroyers simply fail to deliver. 
They do get two points of heart attack for each starter experience, but are you really prepared to fry your brain cells trying to train these people since 1939 with all the terrible equipment they decide to stick with? Tank destroyers are a gimmick. A highly specialized unit for a general purpose one does just fine. Don't take it. Simplify your force and smear everything with tanks. Let's stop the turret with a little caveat. Other nations do have better tank destroyers, especially the artillery anti-tank combos. Oh, the ISU-122, which I may once dedicate a whole poem to. There's been a discussion about how to build your core anti-air defenses since the Panzer General games, and I know that there are people like anti-air guns. However, I believe that focusing on fighters is a far superior approach. Fighters are proactive in nature, they can pursue damage enemy planes, and when you do achieve their superiority, they're useful as very light bombers and scouts. Anti-air guns offer no way of achieving air superiority against a determined opponent, and if there's no enemy in the air anymore, they become dead weight in your limit order of battle. They are much cheaper and do not get shot back at when they attack enemy planes, but your aeroplane losses can be managed through mass attack bonus, so it isn't that much of an advantage, provided your planes are actually good. As a Soviet commander, you might end up buying anti-air cannons to soften up those BF-109s before letting your subpar fighters anywhere near them. Don't get me wrong, however. Anti-air guns provided to use auxiliary forces are very welcome. They do damage enemy planes for one, but they're also the top of the AI's target priority list. They're unmatched as decoys and will attract enemy units like flies to little excrement, slowing down counterattacks and saving your severely damaged units more than once. And let me leave you with a lineup of the core force from my last completed German Grand campaign. There are some deviations from the ideas I've just expressed, mostly because of how the units have been bothered to sell, but the overall approach should be pretty clear. That's it for now.